Welcome to Grace Bible Church. This is our evening service. This is when we are currently going through our 66 book of the Bible series. And we are here tonight gonna look at the book of Isaiah. This is where we take an entire book of the Bible and we preach it in one sermon. And tonight that is the book of Isaiah. So please open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter one. Isaiah chapter one and have... have, uh, Be ready to turn a lot of pages because we're going to be in a lot of different places here uh, this evening. Isaiah is the first book of what we call the major prophets, typically composed of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. Of the book of Isaiah, one commentator says, quote, of all the books in the Old Testament, Isaiah is perhaps the richest. Its literary grandeur is unequaled. Its scope is unparalleled. The breadth of its view of God is unmatched. In so many ways, it is a book of superlatives. Thus, it is no wonder that Isaiah is the most quoted prophet in the New Testament, and along with Psalms and Deuteronomy, one of the most frequently cited of all Old Testament books, close quote. Given that, I want to try to lower your expectations a little bit I'm sure we've all read Isaiah many times in our reading plans, and some of our favorite passages of Scripture are found in this book. Some of our most cherished truths are found in this book, and we're not going to get to all of them. We're not even going to come close. As I began to study this book and read it over and over and over, I began to feel smaller and smaller and smaller. I was overwhelmed by so many grand themes that can be found here that we simply do not have time to cover. And I also simply do not possess the vocabulary to adequately express the grandeur of our mighty God that is found in this book. But we'll make an attempt. So let's get started with some background information. The nation of Israel had a unified kingdom under King David and King Solomon. But after Solomon's death, the kingdom was divided into the northern kingdom known as Israel and the southern kingdom, often referred to simply as Judah. The northern kingdom had 10 tribes associated with it, and the southern kingdom had Judah and Benjamin. Isaiah began his ministry some 180 years after the death of King Solomon. Go ahead and look at chapter 1, verse 1. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, concerning Judah and Jerusalem which he saw during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. The title of this book derives this name from the author, and the Hebrew name for Isaiah means Yahweh is salvation. Isaiah was a prophet to Judah with specific emphasis on Jerusalem. He prophesied during the reigns of the four kings that we hear uh, that were mentioned in verse 1, Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. He began his ministry during the reign of King Uzziah, whose death was in 739 BC. And the prophet prophesied until at least the death of the Assyrian king Sennacherib in 681 BC. A detail that's recorded in Isaiah chapter 37, verse 38. That means that he was prophesying for at least 58 years. 58 years. Tradition states that he was eventually killed by King Manasseh, that's Hezekiah's son, by being cut in two with a saw. The historical context for his ministry covers a lot of ground. King Uzziah was considered a good king, and Judah prospered commercially and militarily. But there was a spiritual decline during that period, and that declining spiritual trajectory over the lifetimes of the kings that would follow eventually led to the fall of Jerusalem and the Babylonian exile about 100 years after Isaiah's death. The definitive world power at the time and for most of Isaiah's life was the Assyrian Empire. And he personally witnessed a couple of key events uh, during his lifetime. He, he was alive during the capture and fall of Samaria. And he was also personally involved in the Assyrian march through Judah. The fall of Samaria took place in 722 BC. And that's where the northern kingdom of Israel was led into exile, never to return. Later, the Assyrians also laid waste to much of Judah, and they came all the way to the doorstep of Jerusalem in 701 BC. As for the content of his prophecy, that that covers a lot of ground too. He makes prophecies about near-fulfillment activities regarding the empires of Assyria and Babylon, as well as the Babylonian exile and post-exilic return. 
He also makes prophecies concerning the first coming of Christ. And finally, he makes many eschatological prophecies about end times, specifically the coming kingdom. When I first started this endeavor, I was planning to provide you with an outline of the book, uh, but I was not able to do that. Every commentator that I've read, and I've read a lot of commentaries on this book, had a different way of outlining this book. And as many times as I've gone through it, as many times as, as much time as I have spent, I did not feel comfortable giving you a, an authoritative outline for the book. And kind of as a, a side note on this, uh, if you do study this book, all of the commentators, and, and I've had a book on commentaries and it listed the top commentators and I got all of those, they were all, all either Amil, which means they do not believe in a literal thousand-year kingdom, or they were pre-mill covenantal, which means they believed that the promises to Israel were actually fulfilled in the church. Neither of those theological systems are helpful when trying to understand what's going on here in the book of Isaiah. That's why I'm so thankful for Abner Chow and his book, I Saw the Lord, A Biblical Theology of Vision. And this is the same book that Smed has referenced multiple times as, we, as we've been going through our Revelation series. His book helpfully tied together a number of things that I had not seen and ultimately helped me understand what's going on here in this book and how that ties in to what's going on in the rest of Scripture. Now that we've had all of this background information, we need to understand the purpose of the book of Isaiah. However, for us to rightly understand the purpose of this book, we're going to have to do a little bit of legwork. We're going to walk through the first six chapters of the book of Isaiah, which functionally are used by the prophet as an introduction to the book as a whole. And that will then lead us to the purpose of the book. As you've read through your Bible reading plans, you may have noticed that the books of Jeremiah and Ezekiel both begin with the prophets encountering Yahweh and receiving their calls and commissions. However, the book of Isaiah doesn't start that way. Isaiah doesn't receive his call and commission until famously in chapter 6 when he encounters the throne room of God. Chronologically, chapter 6 happens first in the prophet's life. So what's going on here in chapters 1 through 5? Let's start in chapter 1. Let's go ahead and look at verses, uh, Isaiah chapter 1, starting in verse 2. Listen, O heavens, and hear, O earth, for Yahweh speaks. Sons I have reared and brought up, But they have revolted against me. An ox knows its owner and a donkey its master's manger. But Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Alas, sinful nation, people weighed down with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, sons who act corruptly. They have abandoned Yahweh. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away from him. This book starts out with Yahweh commanding the heavens and the earth to hear and listen to the indictments that he has against his people. They have revolted against them. They act corruptly. They have abandoned him. They have despised the Holy One of Israel and they have turned away from him. Go ahead and turn, or, uh, jump down to verse 28. But transgressors and sinners will be crushed together, and those who forsake Yahweh will come to an end. Chapter 1 is filled with significant indictments and judgments against God's people. Let's look at chapter 2, starting in verse 1. In verse 1, chapter 2, verse 1 goes, the, that discourse begins in chapter 2, verse 1. It goes all the way through the end of chapter 5. So let's, I'm not going to read that all right now. We're just going to start in verse 1. The word of Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Now it will come about that in the last days, the mountain of the house of Yahweh will be established as the chief of mountains. And it will be raised above the hills and all the nations will stream to it. And many peoples will come and say, come, let us go to the mountain of Yahweh, to the house of the God of Jacob that he may teach us concerning his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go forth from Zion and the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem and he will judge between the nations and will render decisions for many peoples and they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. 
Nation will not lift up sword against nation, and never again will they learn war. Here, the prophet Isaiah saw eschatological realities. That's a fancy word for saying end times realities. For Israel and for the nations. Jerusalem is exalted and the nations stream to it. And there will be peace forevermore. God's promises to Israel will ultimately be fulfilled. There's a hope for Israel. But those promises and that hope, those hopeful eschatological realities are not currently realized. Let's just look at the next verse in verse 5, 5 and 6. Come, house of Jacob, let us walk in the light of Yahweh. For you, God, have abandoned your people, the house of Jacob. Because they are filled with influences from the east, and they are soothsayers like the Philistines, and they strike bargains with the children of foreigners. God has abandoned his people. Why? Being influenced by the ways of the nations, idolatry, and pride, what follows are more indictments and more judgments. Let's look in, starting in verse 12. For Yahweh of hosts will have a day of reckoning against everyone who is proud and lofty, against everyone and against everyone who is lifted up, that he may be abased. And it will be against all the cedars of Lebanon that are lofty and lifted up, against all the oaks of Bashan, against all the lofty mountains, against all the hills that are lifted up, against every high tower, against every fortified wall, against all the ships of Tarshish, against all the beautiful craft. The pride of man will be humbled, and the loftiness of men will be abased. And Yahweh alone will be exalted in that day. But the idols will completely vanish. Men will go into caves of the rocks and into holes of the ground before the terror of Yahweh and the splendor of his majesty when he arises to make the earth tremble. This day of Yahweh is speaking about the day of the Lord, the future eschatological judgment on Israel and the world. God is going to humble the pride of men, everyone that is high and lifted up. Yahweh alone will be exalted in that day. He will not share his glory with another. The rest of chapters 2 and 3 continue with this bleak picture with more indictments and more judgments against Judah and Jerusalem. Then there is a respite in chapter 4, verse 2. So let's look at that. In that day, the branch of Yahweh will be beautiful and glorious. The fruit of the earth will be the pride and the adornment of the survivors of Israel. It will come about that he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem will be called holy. Everyone who is recorded for life in Jerusalem. When the Lord has washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and purged the bloodshed of Jerusalem from her midst by the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning. This is looking forward to an eschatological reality when Messiah, the branch of Yahweh, will be beautiful and glorious when the remnant of the people of Israel are called holy, when they've been purified through these violent judgments, in the midst of all these indictments and severe judgments, here God provides a hope. A hope that, will, that he will spiritually transform his people. God will be the one who actively does the washing the purging, the transforming. He'll take those that are profane and he will make them pure. He'll take the rebellious and he will make them righteous. He will take the defiled and he will make them holy. However, a huge chasm exists between this future spiritual realities of God's people and the contemporary religious environment. Chapter 5 continues the indictments and the judgments against Judah and Jerusalem. Let's look at chapter 5, starting in verse 3. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard than I have not done in it? 
Why, when I expected to produce good grapes, did it produce worthless ones? So now, let me tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge, and it will be consumed. I will break down its wall, and it will become trampled ground. I will lay it waste. It will not be pruned or hoed, but briars and thorns will come up. I will also charge the clouds to rain no rain on it. Drop down to verse 13. Therefore, my people go into exile for their lack of knowledge. Drop further down to verse 20. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. Woe to those who are heroes in drinking wine and valiant men in mixing strong drink, who justify the wicked for a bribe and take away the rights of the ones who are in the right. Verse 24. Therefore, As a tongue of fire consumes stubble and the dry grass collapses into the flame, so their root will become like rot and their blossom blow away as dust. For they have rejected the they have rejected the law of Yahweh of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. On this account, the anger of Yahweh has burned against his people, and he has stretched out his hand against them and struck them down. And the mountains quaked, and their corpses lay like refuse in the middle of the streets. For all this, his anger is not spent, but his hand is still stretched out. Here, God further indicts and proclaims bitter judgments on Judah and Jerusalem. Specifically, he proclaims exile. At the end of chapter 5, he declares that he's going to whistle for a distant nation that he's going to use to come and decimate his people. Chapter 5 ends with, If one looks to the land, behold, there is darkness and distress. Even the light is darkened by its clouds. If the introduction to the book ended on that despairing note, decimation, corpses, and exile by means of a distant nation, the people of Jerusalem and Judah may have called in the question of God's, the reality of God's promises. So far in chapters 1 through 5, we've seen a pattern. We've seen indictments and judgments followed by eschatological realities of an exalted Jerusalem and a holy people. Chapter 1, indictments and judgments. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, eschatological reality about the exaltation of Zion and Jerusalem. Chapter 2, 5 through 4, 1, indictments and judgments. Chapter 4, 2 through 6, eschatological reality of the spiritual transformation of God's people. Chapter 5, indictments, judgments, and exile. What would you expect to follow? Chapter 1, indictments and judgments, eschatological reality. Indictments and judgments, eschatological reality. Indictments, judgments, eschatological reality. Given the context and pattern here, I think we should expect what would follow is an eschatological reality, and that brings us to chapter 6. Verses 1 through 3. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is Yahweh of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. This vision of the Lord Adonai, sitting on his throne, high and lifted up, with these fiery creatures flying around, crying out, holy, holy, holy is Yahweh of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The end of verse 3 says, the whole earth is full of his glory. When does that happen? When is the earth presently full of of his glory. The wording found here of God's glory filling the earth is only found in three other places. 
Numbers 14, 21, Psalm 72, 19, and Habakkuk 2, 14. All of those places speak of God's glory filling the earth as a future reality, not a current state of affairs, but one to be anticipated. Verse 3 is describing an eschatological reality. In the future, at the end of time, in the kingdom, God's glory will fill the entire earth. This will happen when the king is reigning on earth and in his kingdom and is populated by a holy people that reflect the glory of God. I believe Isaiah's end times vision here begins with the heavenly coronation of Yahweh as king and finishes with the outcome of God's eschatological plan, namely that the whole earth is full of his glory. Since this is an eschatological vision, who exactly is sitting on the throne in verse 1? Verse 1 tells us that the Lord, Adonai, is sitting on the throne. Verses 3 and 5 tell us that Yahweh of hosts is the one sitting on the throne. The rest of the book of Isaiah adds a little bit of color to this question. Isaiah identifies one, speaks of one, that has a miraculous birth, is assigned titles of divinity, sits on the throne of David, has a reign over his kingdom that will never end, reigns in righteousness and justice, gives sight to the blind, brings Jacob back to God, is a light to the nations, poured himself out to death, justifies the many, bears their iniquities, extends God's salvation to the ends of the earth. He also performs tasks that Yahweh reserves exclusively for himself. He performs salvation, redemption, intercession, and displaying God's glory. And in Isaiah 52, verse 13, God says that his servant will be high and lifted up. This specific language is used four times in the book of Isaiah and nowhere else in the Old Testament. The other three times it's used is used to describe God. This is saying that God's service, servant is in fact God. This is the same language that we find here in Isaiah 6.1. The servant that Isaiah speaks of later in the book is Yahweh. The servant is the Messiah, which means that the Messiah is Yahweh. And on this side of history, we know the Messiah's name, which means that Jesus is sitting on the throne. This is an eschatological, heavenly vision of the coronation of Jesus the Christ, the Messiah. There is a lot of intertextual evidence within the book of Isaiah to show that the prophet is seeing the Messiah, God's servant on the throne. But as a final word on this, we'll let the inspired commentary, on, essentially the inspired commentary on this chapter speak. Go ahead and turn your Bibles to John chapter 12. Verse 38. John chapter 12, verse 38. I'm actually going to start reading the end of uh, verse 36. These things Jesus spoke, and uh, and he went away and hid himself from them. But though he had performed so many signs before them, yet they were not believing in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah, the prophet, which he spoke, Lord, who has believed our report and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason, they could not believe. For Isaiah said again, he has blinded their eyes and he hardened their heart so that they would not see with their eyes and perceive with their heart and be converted and I heal them. And in verse 41, these things Isaiah said because he saw his glory and he spoke of him Here the Apostle John, after quoting from Isaiah chapter 6, verse 10, says in John uh, 12, 41, these things Isaiah said because he saw his glory and he spoke of him. The Apostle John says that Isaiah saw Jesus' glory and that the prophet spoke of Jesus in Isaiah chapter 6. So let's go back to chapter 6. I believe Isaiah the prophet is seeing a vision of the end of time 
And it begins with the heavenly coronation and enthronement of Jesus as king and finishes with the outcome of God's eschatological plan, namely that the thrice holy King Jesus is reigning on the earth and his glory truly and completely fills the earth. In this vision, in verses one through three, we see the the culmination of all of human history. We see the end for which all things exist. The trajectory of all past and all future history is terminating in this event. That's the target. That's what will happen, and it's guaranteed by the omnipotent, sovereign creator of all things, and we can bank on that. What is the prophet's response to seeing this awesome vision of the future? Let's look at verse 5, chapter 6. Isaiah says, Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, Yahweh of hosts. The prophet is confronted with the transcendence and imminence of the thrice holy God, and he is undone. He cries out in despair, Woe is me! He immediately recognizes his sinfulness and the sinfulness of his people. He understands the true separation, an infinite separation between God and his holiness and he in his sinfulness. He is not worthy to be in God's presence. Verses 6 and 7. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand which he had taken from the altar with tongs, he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. God purifies him. God makes him worthy. And his iniquity is taken away, and his sins are forgiven. Now that he's been made worthy, we're going to see his task. Look at verse 8. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? That's an interesting plural pronoun. Then I said, Here am I. Send me. He said, God said, Go, tell this people, keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull, and their eyes dim. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their hearts, hear with with their ears and understand with their hearts and return and be healed. Then I said, Lord, how long? And he answered, until cities are devastated and without inhabitant. Houses are without people and the land is utterly desolate. Yahweh has removed men far away and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. Yet, there will be a tenth portion in it, and it will again be subject to burning like a tamarinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is felled. The holy seed is its stump. Isaiah is tasked to go to this rebellious and defiled people, to give them a message from Yahweh, the Holy One of Israel, of judgment and of salvation. And while he's told that these people will by and large fail to listen, there is a concrete hope that ultimately the sovereign God of the universe will bring about a spiritual transformation of his people and the nations when in the future Messiah reigns from Mount Zion in Jerusalem and fills the whole earth with his glory. Isaiah spends the rest of his life and ministry at least 58 years and the rest of this book carrying out that task. This leads to the purpose of a book as a whole. The purpose of the book of Isaiah is, and it's up here for you, to declare to Israel primarily and to the nations that the sovereign God of the universe is orchestrating history to bring about judgment and salvation that leads to Messiah reigning in his kingdom on the earth that's populated by a transformed holy people. I know that's a bit longer than maybe what you were expecting, 
but it's the entire book of Isaiah. I guess I could have said something pretty simple like, God wins. But that didn't seem to capture enough. Now that we're done with the introduction, we're going to go ahead and take the next couple of hours to go over the rest of the book. You guys are thinking I'm joking, but I could. Just, and just a note before we get started, there are just some grand themes that you should look for when you read through the book of Isaiah that we are simply not even going to cover here tonight. And these, we, these themes are weaved throughout the whole book. God is creator and maker of all things. God's supremacy and greatness, God's holiness, God preserving a remnant, God's compassion and relentless pursuit of his people, and there are others. And sadly, we do not have enough time to expound on those. So let's go ahead and get started. And we're going to use the purpose statement here to guide our highlights of the rest of the book of Isaiah. And again, so that is to declare to Israel primarily and to the nations that the sovereign God of the universe is orchestrating history to bring about judgment and salvation that leads to Messiah reigning in his kingdom on the earth that's populated by a transformed holy people. We're going to go ahead and cover this in three points, bringing us to point number one. The sovereign God of the universe is orchestrating history, number one, to bring about judgment. Why? Why is he bringing about judgment better question is why does he the thrice holy god let any defiled profane godless unholy people live at all all of us are sinners we've all fallen short of the glory of god in isaiah 64 verse 6 the prophet when looking back includes himself along with those confessing their utter unworthiness to be in god's presence when he says for all of us have become like one who is unclean And all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. The best, most righteous deed an unbeliever can do is like a filthy garment before God. And this filthy garment is referring to a used menstrual cloth. An unbeliever's best efforts are unclean unclean and disgusting in the sight of God. Unbelievers, both of Israel and the nations, deserve nothing but God's judgment and condemnation. Let's take a look at several texts of this judgment, starting with Isaiah chapter 10. This passage sits in a larger context of judgment against Israel, Judah, and Assyria, but we're only going to read a portion of it, starting in verse 5. So Isaiah chapter 10, starting in verse 5. Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger and the staff in whose hands is my indignation. I send it against a godless nation and commission it against the people of my fury to capture booty and to seize plunder and to trample them down like mud in the streets. Yet it does not so intend, nor does it, nor does it plan so in its heart, but rather it is its purpose to destroy and to cut off many nations. For it says, are not my princes all kings, as it, and is not Kalno like Carchemish, or Hamath like Arpid, or Samaria like Damascus? As my hand has reached to the kingdoms of the idols, whose graven images were greater than those of Jerusalem and Samaria, shall I not do to Jerusalem and her images, just as I have done to Samaria and her idols? So it will be, when the Lord has completed all his work on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, he will say, I will punish the fruit of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the pomp of his haughtiness. These people are prideful and arrogant, deceptive, foolish, godless, evildoers, unjust robbers, and idolaters. The indictments against Israel are not very different from those against the nations. Here Isaiah prophesies of God's judgment on all of Israel, both northern and southern kingdom, He describes several stages of judgment and ultimately he's going to bring the Assyrians against the northern kingdom, which we know will end in their exile forever, never to return. And he will then later bring the Assyrians against the southern kingdom to lay it to waste. In addition to that, he's, after he's done judging his people, he's going to judge the Assyrians, the ones that he used to carry out his judgment, the judgment on his people. 
Next, I want to draw attention to an entire section. For the, you know, when you've gone through your reading plans, you may have noticed in Isaiah chapters 13 through 21 that they contain almost nonstop judgment against the nations. Almost. Against Babylon, Assyria, Philistia, Moab, Aram, Ethiopia, Egypt, Edom, Arabia, and Tyre. God judges and will judge the nations. Let's take a look at another text that reveals God's judgment specifically in the future. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 24. Starting in verse 3. The earth will be completely laid waste and completely despoiled, for Yahweh has spoken this word. The earth mourns and withers. The world fades and withers. The exalted of the people of the earth fade away. The earth is also polluted by its inhabitants, for they transgressed laws, violated statutes, broke the everlasting covenant. Therefore, a curse devours the earth, and those who live in it are held guilty. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men are left. Drop down to verse 17. Terror and pit and snare confront you, O inhabitant of the earth. Then it will be that he who flees the report of disaster will fall into the pit, and he who climbs out of the pit will be caught in a snare. For the windows above are opened, and the foundations of the earth shake. The earth is broken asunder, the earth is split through, the earth is shaken violently. The earth reels to and fro like a drunkard, and it totters like a shack. For its transgression is heavy upon it, and it will fall never to rise again. So it will happen in that day that Yahweh will punish the host of heaven on high and the kings of the earth on earth. They will be gathered together like prisoners in the dungeon, and, it will be confined in, and they will be confined in prison. And after many days, they will be punished. The moon will be abashed and the sun ashamed. For Yahweh of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, and his glory will be before his elders. A terrifying look at this eschatological judgment on the earth and those that are on it. God's end times judgment extends to the host of heaven and those on the earth and affects even creation itself. And the final objective of all that judgment at the end of verse 23, for Yahweh of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and his glory will be before his elders. Let's take a look at one last verse about judgment. Last verse in the Bible, in the uh, book of Isaiah. Chapter 66, verse 24. 66, 24. Then they will go forth and look on the corpses of the men who have transgressed against me. For their worm will not die, and their fire will not be quenched, and they will be an abhorrence to all mankind. The book closes speaking of God's eternal punishment for those that rebel against him. Those that refuse to repent of their sin have only one destination, hell, where their suffering will never end. God is sovereignly orchestrating history to bring about his judgment on people, on, on the wicked that ultimately lead to Messiah reigning in his kingdom on the earth. And his kingdom is going to be populated by a holy people, not by a wicked people. But the people are wicked. How can anyone populate God's kingdom? How is God going to bring about this spiritual transformation such that his kingdom is populated by a holy people? How is he going to make them from profane to pure and from rebellious to righteous, from defiled to holy? That brings us to our next point. The sovereign God of the universe is orchestrating history, number two, to bring about salvation. Like we said at the beginning of our last point, mankind deserves nothing but judgment. So why would he bring about salvation for anyone? To display his grace, mercy, love on those unable and unwilling to come to him and obey him? so that his supremacy in all things would be unchallenged and that he alone would be exalted and his glory would fill all the earth 
when those transformed ones worship him and ascribe glory to his name forever. Let's take a look at some, past, some uh, different texts dealing with God's salvation. And we're going to start in Isaiah chapter 12. So if you noticed, for our first point, we went from left to right. We're going to do that for each one of these subsequent points. So we're going to go back uh, to Isaiah here, chapter 12. The context here actually starts in chapter 11 and is looking forward to an end times reality when Messiah is reigning in his kingdom and he has restored the remnant of his people, Israel. Starting in verse 1 of chapter 12. Then you, restored remnant of Israel, will say on that day, I will give thanks to you, O Yahweh, for although you were angry with me, your anger is turned away and you comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For Yah, Yahweh is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. Therefore, you, restored Israel, will joyously draw water from the springs of salvation. And in that day, you will say, give thanks to Yahweh, call on his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Make them remember that his name is exalted. Praise Yahweh in song, for he has done excellent things. Let this be known throughout the earth. Cry aloud and shout for joy, O habitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. At the end of time, the Holy One of Israel is on the earth and in their midst. The future restored remnant of Israel will break out in worship. Salvation has come to the remnant of Israel. God has pretty much been angry with the nation of Israel for most of its existence, but here it is said that they will worship. Yahweh is their strength. Yahweh is their salvation. He is exalted, and he has done glorious things. The restored remnant of Israel will, in the future, exclaim these imperatives that are found in verses 4 through 6. This should be a little bit shocking from what we've read about Israel, from what we see even on our own day. The northern kingdom, the ten tribes, were exiled in 722 BC, never to return. The fall of Jerusalem occurred in 70 AD, removing Judah. The nation of Israel effectively ceased to exist for roughly 1900 years. It wasn't until 1948 that the nation of Israel, as we know it today, even began its existence. And while they may have a nation politically, Their hearts are far from Yahweh Messiah and they have much judgment and purification to undergo. But God is clearly orchestrating history with his end goal in mind. Before 1948, people would have said, I don't know how God's going to keep these promises to Israel, how they're going to get fulfilled. They don't even have a nation and they're not in the land. On this side of 1948, we can say, well, at least there's a nation and they have some of the land. I don't know how this is all going to be brought, to, brought about, but God tells us that a remnant of the northern kingdom, which hasn't been around for 2,700 years, and a remnant of the southern kingdom, which took 1,900 years off, will be restored and worshiping Yahweh at the end of time. Praise God. Let's look at a passage that's a little more specific about God's salvation to the nations. We're going to look at Isaiah 19. Chapter 19, starting in verse 18. In that day, five cities in the land of Egypt will be speaking the language of Canaan and swearing allegiance to Yahweh of hosts. One will be called the city of destruction. In that day, there will be an altar to Yahweh in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar to Yahweh near its border. It will become a sign and a witness to Yahweh of hosts in the land of Egypt. For they will cry to Yahweh because of oppressors, and he will send them a savior and a champion, and he will deliver them. For thus Yahweh will make himself known to Egypt, and the Egyptians will know Yahweh in that day. They will even worship with sacrifice and offering. They will make a vow to Yahweh and perform it. Yahweh will strike Egypt, striking, but healing, so that they will return to Yahweh. And he will respond to them and will heal them. 
In that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria, and the Assyrians will come into Egypt, and the Egyptians into Assyria, and the Egyptians will worship with the Assyrians. In that day, Israel will be the third party with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the earth, whom Yahweh of hosts has blessed, saying, blessed is Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my inheritance. Are you kidding God is going to call Egypt my people? Egypt who oppressed and enslaved the nation of Israel? Yeah. Here it says that in the future, using eschatological language, some portion of Egypt is going to speak Hebrew, swear allegiance to Yahweh, cry to Yahweh, know Yahweh, worship Yahweh. And God is going to send them a savior and a champion. He will deliver them. He will make himself known to them and he will heal them. If that weren't shocking enough, God is going to call Assyria the work of my hands? The same Assyria that at the time of Isaiah's writing is the current world power and political enemy of both kingdoms of Israel. This same wicked people that God is using to judge and exile the northern kingdom and lay waste to the southern kingdom. How hard would this passage have been for the Jew to hear? How much of a stumbling block would this passage have been for the nation of Israel? How could God possibly save such a wicked people that have harmed Israel in so many ways? How could God call them my people in the work of my hands? They don't deserve it. If salvation was based on what we've done or we do on, or what we deserve, there's not a single person, not a single person who would be worthy. No one deserves to be saved. No one deserves salvation. But God is orchestrating history such that he will save those from among the nations, and specifically here, a remnant of Egypt and a remnant of Assyria. He's going to spiritually transform them into worshipers of Yahweh. Finally, in this section, let's turn to Isaiah 53. Here in Isaiah 53, the believing remnant of Israel laments and confesses what the nation, their ancestors, did in rejecting the servant, in rejecting Messiah. And as we read this, we we need to be careful when we hit the pronouns not to simply insert ourselves into those. Those pronouns are the future remnant of Israel looking back and confessing and lamenting what their nation had done. Let's start in verse 1. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of Yahweh been revealed? For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised. And we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but Yahweh has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation... Who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due? His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death 
because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. But Yahweh was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of Yahweh will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot with him, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong, because he poured himself out to death, and was numbered with tra- the transgressors, yet he himself bore the sin of many, and interceded for the transgressors. God saves sinners. He saves them through the atoning sacrifice of his servant. Here in Isaiah 53, we have the most detailed and clear description in the whole Old Testament of how God saves sinners. Messiah, the innocent one, no deceit, no violence. He is the righteous one. Messiah was despised, forsaken, scourged. He bore griefs, carried sorrows, was pierced for transgressions. He was crushed for iniquities. He justifies them and he bears iniquity, poured himself out to death, was numbered with transgressors, bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. There is only one way of salvation and that's through the atoning, sacrificial death of Messiah. He, the righteous one, is the only one that justifies the many, that bears their iniquities, that bears their sins. God has orchestrated history to bring about this salvation by sending his Messiah to earth as a suffering servant, a suffering servant by the name of Jesus, such that he would provide the, ne- provide the necessary atoning sacrifice for sins. And in the future, he will radically provide salvation to a remnant of Israel such that they will lament and confess what we have just read here in Isaiah 53. And for those of us among the nations, these truths describe our Savior and describe his work on our behalf. Praise God that he saves sinners. It's not dependent on us. We can't do it. He takes a defiled people and he makes them holy. And that brings us to our final point. The sovereign God of the universe is orchestrating history that leads to Messiah reigning in his kingdom on earth. Messiah will reign in his kingdom on earth and his kingdom will be populated by a holy people such that the whole earth is full of his glory. This is the target for which all of history is aiming and the end for which all things exist. Let's take a look at several texts here starting in uh, Isaiah chapter 11. These will go a little bit faster. Starting in 11, verse 6, And the wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the young goat, and the calf with the young lion and the fatling together, and a little boy will lead them. And the cow and, and bear will graze, and their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like an ox. And the nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra, and, wean, and the weaned child will put his hand on the viper's den. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of Yahweh as the waters cover the sea. The outcome of Messiah coming is going to reverse the curse. A reverse of predation, the the wolf with the lamb, the leopard with the goat, and the calf with the lion. The lion's going to become a vegetarian. The viper will not hurt any children. And verse 9 says, the whole earth will be full of the knowledge of Yahweh. Isaiah 24, verse 23. The end of verse 23. For Yahweh of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, and his glory will be before his elders. Again, Yahweh reigning on the earth, Mount Zion, and his glory will be before his elders. Let's go to chapter 25, 
verse 6. Yahweh of hosts will prepare a lavish banquet for all peoples on this mountain, a banquet of aged wine, choice pieces of marrow, and refined aged wine. And on this mountain, he will swallow up the covering which is over all the peoples, even the veil which is stretched over all nations. He will swallow up death for all time, and the Lord Yahweh will wipe tears away from all faces. And he will remove the reproach of his people from all the earth. For Yahweh has spoken. And it will be said in that day, Behold, this is our God for whom we have waited, he, that he might save us. This is Yahweh for whom we have waited. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. This passage provides a number of kingdom realities, a lavish banquet, no more tears. Yahweh has swallowed up death for all time and removes the reproach of his people from all the earth. Yahweh has a kingdom and he is populating it with a holy transformed people. Let's go to Isaiah 65, verse 17. For behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth, and the former things will not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem for rejoicing and her peoples for gladness. I will also rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people and there will no longer be heard in her the voice of weeping or the sound of crying. Again, here at the end of time, we see more kingdom realities. God will bring a new heaven and a new earth. He will rejoice in Jerusalem and will be glad in his people. And that is kind of a shocking contrast based on some of the other things that we've read. And finally, let's look at Isaiah 66, verses 22 through 24. For just as the new heavens and the new earth, which I make, will endure before me, declares Yahweh, so your offspring and your name will endure. And it shall be from new moon to new moon and from Sabbath to Sabbath, all mankind will come to bow down before me, says Yahweh. Then they will go forth and look on the corpses of men who have transgressed against me, For their worm will not die, and their fire will not be quenched, and they will be an abhorrence to all mankind. This passage sits in the context that is looking at Jerusalem's eschatological future. Jerusalem will be the center of world attention, and all of mankind will come and bow down before Yahweh. The end of this book finishes with Messiah reigning in his kingdom on the earth. And it has a sobering contrast here at the end. Those that make up and populate his kingdom, they will come and bow down before him. However, those that have transgressed against him are seen suffering eternal punishment where their worm will not die and their fire will not be quenched. That's a pretty sobering way to end the book. And yet when we stop and zoom back out and look at the whole and we see God working, again, we see the message that God is declaring to to Israel and to the nations that he is orchestrating history. He's bringing about judgments. He's bringing about these salvation. And it's going to lead to Messiah reigning in his kingdom on the earth. And it's going to be populated by a holy, transformed people. The book of Isaiah is very encouraging and hopeful for believers. But for unbelievers, it should be terrifying. Where are you? You need to evaluate where you are before the Lord. Have you been transformed? Have you been set apart? Have you... Are, and are you becoming more holy every day by his grace because of your trust in Messiah, because of your trust in Christ? Our time here on the earth is short and all of human history is moving towards that end where Messiah reigns here on earth. And believer, we get to look forward to that day when we are populating his kingdom with him reigning, with Christ reigning. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time that we've had spending in your word. 
clearly seeing you enthroned, seeing your glory and your majesty, seeing your judgments, seeing your salvation. Jesus, we look forward to seeing that day when all of this is realized at the end of history when you are on your throne on Mount Zion, reigning, and for all of us believers, we are populating with other believers your kingdom forever. Jesus, it's in your great name we pray. Amen.